Well, good morning, everybody. I I know I say this all the time, but it's just a privilege to be with you today that you would take an hour out of your life, whether you're here for the first time or the 400th, to be here. Uh, When you walk around Southside nowadays, every once in a while you'll see a shirt. I see a few of them as I look out uh, right now. It says, we are for this city. We are for this city. And I I thought I would explain that a little bit. Uh, We have come to the conclusion over the course of time that, that, that we are not in this city to have an adversarial relationship with the city, to rebuke them, to condemn them, to fight against our city. We've also come to the conclusion that we're not here to have a reciprocal relationship with this city, where we say, you know what, if you do something for us, we'll do something for you. What we've come to the conclusion of is that we are here to love this city, and, and love gives without looking for anything in return. We are here to love this city. And part of that happens here, by the way. Part of it is that we hope that whether you're here for the first time or the 400th, that when you leave today, that you would have a greater sense of hope than when you walked in. But, but, it's, but it's more than singing, and the singing is great, and it's more than preaching, and the preaching is just out of this world, okay? But, 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 but honestly, it's so much more than that. Like, like, like we want to connect with you. And I really felt this morning as I, as I woke up and I was thinking about you and I was thinking about me, it's so important that, that we realize that, that we are here for each other too. And, 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 and in the back, uh, you're behind you to your left, there's a prayer area on your way out, there's a next step center. Man, if there is anything that we could do for you, if there is any question we could answer for you, if you would like some prayer, if, 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 you, if you would like some support, if there's anything that, that, that we can do to, to, to let you know that we are here for you and we are here for each other, man, we would love to do that. Please do not hesitate. There's Lance. Lance beat me on golf on Friday, and then they put a picture of him up on the screen earlier. That's humiliating. But anyways, uh, we are here for everybody except for Lance, who beat me at golf. Um, we're, we're in this series called The Upward Fall that takes us all the way through the end of Easter. We call it The Upward Fall because Easter is a paradox, isn't it? Like, I really believe, I really know that the events of that first Easter weekend changed history, completely. But it's a paradox because Easter begins with the crucifixion. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Savior of the world, hanging on a Roman cross, dying. And in that moment, one could easily have assumed that all was lost, but it's the upward fall because the truth is, all was just about to be won. And in that moment, it would have been easy to assume that darkness was descending, but the truth is, hope was just about to rise. It's the upward fall. It's like, in that moment, it was like chaos was just about to take over. But it was in that moment that peace came down. For me, when I think about Easter, I think about Easter as the unequivocal proof that God absolutely can and does right straight with crooked lines. So to be completely transparent and honest with you, I'm praying for a miracle in my life this Easter. I, I don't want Easter just to be a long weekend for me. I don't want it to just be part of the church calendar. Like I, I, I'm praying for a miracle in my heart and, and my mind and my soul this year, and, and I'm praying the same for you. The, 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 ho- the hope that rose up on that first Easter weekend would rise up in my life and your life this year. That the power that played out in that first Easter weekend would play out in our lives and through our lives this year. That the, that the victory and, and the joy and the strength and the vision from that first Easter would come to typify my life to a greater degree this Easter than ever before. And so what we've been doing is we've been following the path that Jesus took to prepare himself and his disciples for the first Easter. And asking that God, that as we study the path that Jesus took to prepare himself and his disciples for the first Easter, that we would be prepared for this Easter. And so we started this series off in a little town called Bethany, two miles outside of Jerusalem. And Jesus and his disciples stopped there for a party, hosted by three of Jesus' friends, Lazarus and his two sisters, Mary and Martha. 
and, and, and the party was basically to celebrate that Lazarus had been dead, but he was raised to life by Jesus. What a party that must have been. It was in this moment, by the way, that the opposition to Jesus took on a decidedly deadly tone. It's important that we realize this today. That from the beginning of Jesus' ministry, he was opposed strongly by a group of religious Jews. Some of them were the Pharisees and the chief priests and the teachers of the law. And, and, and they opposed Jesus at every turn because he had a message that was diametrically opposed to their message. See, Jesus stepped into human history with a message that we now refer to as the gospel. And the gospel basically says this, that God has something for you. Forgiveness, salvation, mercy, hope for you. And he's not looking for anything from you. Nothing in return. That God's plan is all about what he has for you. And yet the religious Jews in that day, their message was the exact opposite. Their message was God wants something from you. And listen, they said, and we are his special representatives, and we will tell you exactly what that is. Oh, you want God to love you? We'll tell you what to do to earn his love. When you respect us, it's like you're respecting God because we're his representatives, we're his special agents. When you're, when you're reverent towards us, you're reverent towards God. When you obey us, you're obeying God. Think about the powerful position that placed them in. The, the, their privilege and their prestige and their power depended on the fact that the people believed that they needed to earn God's love. And so in that sense, th their very way of life relied on the pain of the people. And then Jesus steps into human history and says, no matter who you are or where you've been or what you've done, God loves you right now. You, you, you don't need to do anything to earn his love. He absolutely, completely loves you. I was thinking about Natasha earlier talking about baptism. Baptism is interesting because I remember for me, when I was thinking about getting baptized as an adult, uh, I didn't really want to at first because I thought, I was not, I'm, like, I'm not worthy of getting baptized. I've got to get my ducks in a row first. That's religious thinking, isn't it? That, 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 that's again going back to that paradigm that says, I gotta earn God's love. Well, let, let me tell you, if, if you're a Christian and you haven't been baptized as, as an adult, uh, you don't need to do anything. But what I would suggest to you is that every time that you just obey God's voice, he just has something for you again, and again, and again. So what happened is, so the, the religious Jews, they need to oppose Jesus because their very way of life depends on the misery of the people and he's there to eradicate the misery of the people and so they're opposing Jesus, they're contradicting Jesus, they're trying to discredit Jesus, they're trying to turn the tide of public opinion against Jesus but, but it was in that moment when Jesus called Lazarus out of the tomb that they realized it's not working. We will not be able to stop this message. And, and that was the moment that the plans accelerated because they said, uh, if, we're gonna, if we're gonna shut this guy up, the only way to do it is to kill him. So in that moment, they decided not only did they wanna kill Jesus, but they were gonna get rid of Lazarus too, by the way. That was a Saturday that was the, in, in Bethany. And, and, the, and the next day, uh, as we follow the path of Jesus in preparation for that first Easter, the next day was Sunday, and, and, and people refer to that Sunday as Palm Sunday. And Jesus uh, rode into Jerusalem on the colt of a donkey. Some scholars call it the triumphal entry, and last week we talked about the fact that it sure was a different kind of triumph, wasn't it? It's a triumph that goes deeper than this world and further than this life, because he's a different kind of king. He's not a king that's looking to take anything from you. He's just a king who has something for you, and he brings a different kind of peace a peace that goes deeper than this world and beyond this life. The next day was, was Monday, and, and in Monday, on Monday, Jesus went into the temple in Jerusalem. And he had this righteous anger, man. Like he, 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 he was flipping tables over, and he was kicking people out. 
And, and basically, it was that old issue again. It was these religious Jews, and they were there, and, 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 and their power depended on the misery of the people. They were there to say, look it, you need, God needs something from you. He won't love you unless. Basically, what they were doing is this. They were putting themselves uh, up as, as a barrier between people and God. And Jesus said, you don't want to be there. That's not a good place to be. That's not a safe place to be. And the next day on Tuesday, Jesus was preaching and he gave the Pharisees and the religious Jews seven warnings. It's called the seven woes. Woe to you. Woe to you, Pharisees. You placed yourself as a barrier between people and God. That is not a safe place to be because God's love is so fierce and so overpowering and so incredible. He will blow right through you to get to his people. Woe to you. And the next day was Wednesday. Wednesday was a day of uh, quiet preparation, actually, in Bethany for Jesus and his disciples, getting ready for what was going to come next. And then comes Thursday, the day before Good Friday. Jesus and his disciples had a Passover meal together in an upper room in Jerusalem. Some people refer to this as the Last Supper. And Jesus looked at his disciples and he said, over the next hours, you will see the extent of my love. Don't forget it. Don't ever forget it. He said, because, because you need to remember that as you have been loved, you need to love. You were born to love as you have been loved. In fact, Jesus went so far as to say, um, from now on, my disciples, the way that people will recognize them is, is love. That's, that's, how, that, that's how they'll know that you're my disciple. Not, 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 all, not your great theology, not your cool clothes, not, 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 not the movies you watch or the music you listen to, but more than anything else, people will recognize you by your love. And then Jesus left the Last Supper and he headed to a garden called Gethsemane. It was there that he prayed with so much uh, anxiety that, that, that his, his sweat was like drops of blood. He said, God, if there's any other way for this redemption plan to play out, can we do that instead? But not my will, but your will be done. As he was preparing to leave the garden, uh, I'm going to pick up the story there, and, and I'm going I'm, I'm to leave. The, the, the events start to happen so quickly at this point that, that I'm going to read a very lengthy passage of Scripture from the voices of the Gospel writers. So as Jesus is leaving the garden, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. <clears throat> Arrest him. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi, and he kissed him. Jesus replied, Friend, do what you came for. Then the detachment of soldiers with its commander and the Jewish officials arrested Jesus and led him to the palace of the Roman governor. By now it was early morning, and to avoid, avoid ceremonial uncleanness, the Jews did not enter the palace. They wanted to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and asked, what charges are you bringing against this man? If he were not a criminal, they replied, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said, take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. But we have no right to execute anyone, the Jews objected. This happened so that the words, of Jesus, the words Jesus had spoken indicating the kind of death he was going to die would be fulfilled. While Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sent him this message. I don't have anything to do with this, that innocent man, for I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. Then Pilate took Jesus and he had him flogged, and the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered a whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him and then twisted together a crown of thorns, thorns and set it on his head. 
They put a staff in his right hand and knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, king of the Jews, they said. They spit on him and took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. Once more, Pilate came out and said to the Jews, Look, I'm bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, Here is the man. Here is your king. But they shouted, Take him away. Take him away. Crucify him. Shall I crucify your king? Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priests answered. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that instead of an uproar was starting, he took the water and washed his hands. He took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. It's your responsibility. All the people answered, let his blood be on us and our children. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him, along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence. We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you, came into, when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness came over all the land. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice. My God, my God, why, <clears throat> why have you forsaken me? Jesus said, it is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. Jesus was nailed to the cross at 9 a.m. At noon, darkness descended <clears throat> across the entire land. At three o'clock, he died. He took his last breath and in that moment, uh, light shattered the darkness. And at the temple in Jerusalem, there was this curtain that was hung. And, and, and the curtain was this barrier that represented uh, a barrier between common people and the holy of holies, God's presence. And in that moment that Jesus died, that curtain was torn from the top to the bottom. No more barriers. No more restrictions between God and his people. So here we are. Here we are, you and me. We're at the cross. See, I, I really believe that, that history is a funnel, and my life and your life, it's a funnel, and, and we always end up here eventually, don't we? And I would suggest not just once, but over and over again, we're brought to the cross. The, the cross is an interesting symbol in our culture, for sure. I would suggest that the cross has been tattooed on more people than any other symbol. I would, I would say that the, 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 the cross has been, been a symbol used to shape more jewelry than any other symbol. You, you find images of the cross everywhere, and, and I don't think it's because our culture has a morbid fascination with instruments of execution. There's something about the cross. See, I, I believe that we all end up there eventually. And, and, and I think we all have to answer the question of the cross. 
I think that question is illustrated really well with a conversation that Jesus had just before he died. It says this, one, one of the criminals who, hu- who hung there hurled insults at Jesus. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the, the same sentence. We are punished justly for we're getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. Today you will be with me in paradise. The question of the cross. And, and I really believe that we all get there eventually and we all have to answer eventually. And I think there's only two answers. The first is a closed fist and the second is an outstretched hand. See, I think deep down inside of you and me, we, we all realize that we need salvation. Can, can I put that a different way? I think deep down inside of you and me, we look around the world that we live in and we say, something's wrong here. Like, I look around the world, by the way, and I see that there's a lot right in this world, man. There's beauty, and there's hope, and there's love, and there's joy, and, and, and it's good. But, but, but I look around the world and I also see that, that, that even though there's so much right with this world, there's also so much wrong. There's beauty, but there's also ugly, and there's also darkness, and there's also sickness, and there's also violence, and there's also hatred, and there's also death. And something inside of me and something inside of you says, no, no, th- 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 this is wrong. And we long for a hope that goes a little bit higher than this world. We, we long for all those wrongs to be made right. I think in truth it's been the, uh, it's been a quest that we've seen play out all through history. You look through history and around the world today and you see countless worldviews and philosophies and religions and, and, and we're all looking for a hope that goes higher than the world. And, and, and yet the message that I see over and over and over again in all of these is that we, if we want a hope that goes higher than this world, then we better build for ourselves a stairway to heaven. That, that, that we, we better do it in our own strength. Like if, if, if I want a hope that goes higher than this world, then, then I better work harder. And I, and, and I, and I gotta build that stairway through my moral excellence, through my performance, through my good deeds. Or, or maybe I got to build this hope that goes higher than this world, this stairway to heaven. Uh, I don't know, like through pleasure, through money, through acquisition. Then man, I, I just got to strive. I, I, I need a hope that goes higher and I got to build the stairway myself. And it sounds good. But there's one thing I see wrong about it. Listen to this. This is crazy. This is crazy because it, it just hit me so hard this week. Look, I look around the world today and I see so much right, you know? So much beauty, so much hope, so much love, so much joy. But, but, but I also see so much wrong. So much darkness and, 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 and despair. And then I look inside of me. And guess what I find? The same thing. There's a lot right in me, you know? There's probably more right in you, but there's some right in me. There's some beauty. There's some hope. There's some light. But there's also darkness. There's also selfish. There's also despair. There's also sickness. And if I'm going to build for myself a stairway to heaven, a hope that goes higher than this world, then by definition, if I want to make all the wrongs right, don't I need to be all right? H- have you thought of, of that word? All right. How are you doing? I'm all right. No, you're not. I don't think so. Like, I'm not. You're not all right, are you? So, so if I'm going to build a stairway to heaven... I kind of come to this conclusion, I can't, because I'm not all right. Look, I, 
I don't hit the mark every time. I, I sometimes fall short. I'm not trying to make fun of you. You're, you're probably a lot closer than me, but man, like, we've all broken commandments, haven't we? Say, what commandments are you talking about, Mike? Oh, no, I'm not talking about the Ten Commandments. I'm, I'm talking about your own. You've broken your own commandments, correct? You know those days that you say, like, I am not going to lose my temper again. But then you do. Or I'm going to be patient with my kids tomorrow. It's going to be amazing. I'm just going to, and that's so awesome for the first five minutes. Like, you were on a roll, man. Say, I'm not going to fall for that again. You know, I'm not going to fall for that habit or that behavior or that substance or that addiction ever again. And sometimes you don't and sometimes you, you do. You say, you know what? I'm, I don't care what people think of me anymore. I don't live for the approval of people. I'm just going to live my own life. And how's that working for you? Or you sit in a crowded room full of people and you got this bag of dino, dino sour candies and you should share, but you eat them all yourself because you're selfish. That's just me. It's probably not you, but you get what I'm saying. If I'm going to build a stairway to heaven, then I need to be all right, but I'm not all right. And where does that bring us? It brings us back to the cross. See, because amidst all the worldviews and amidst all the philosophies and amidst all the religions of human history is Jesus hanging on a cross between two thieves. While some people say we need to build a stairway to heaven, Jesus Christ on the cross between two criminals is God reaching down and saying, <clears throat> You want a hand? It's the question of the cross. There's only one of two responses. It's a closed fist <clears throat> or an outstretched hand. It says, yeah, I could use a hand. There's this king named David who wrote about it in, in, in Psalm 40 in the Old Testament of the Bible. He said, I waited patiently for the Lord, he inclined and he heard my cry. He lifted me out of the muck and the mire and he put my feet on solid ground. It's the question of the cross. See, what, 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 what some religions and some philosophies and some worldviews and what my own mind sometimes will tell me, that, that it's up to me to build a stairway to heaven, amidst all of that is Jesus hanging on a cross between two criminals. And it's God's way of reaching his hand down into human history to you, saying, you need a hand? When Jesus stepped into human history, he came to defeat death. I, I would suggest to you that death is the ultimate expression of the wrongness of our world. Like we look around our world and we know something's wrong, but death is the ultimate expression of that. That, 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 that. That's why when we see death, when we look ahead to our own death, when we see death of people that we love, or sometimes people that we don't even know, there's something inside of us that says, that's wrong. That makes me angry. And you know what? It should. Because it's never the way that things were supposed to be. And Jesus stepped into human history to defeat something you need to face it. God can't face death. So Jesus, fully God, took on flesh and bone and moved into our neighborhood and he faced death to defeat it for you and for me. Some scholars talk about the fact that Jesus on the cross performed the beautiful exchange. Jesus, though there was no wrong found in him, willingly died. And he did that so that we can give him all our wrong and he can give us all his right. That we can give him our sins and he can give us salvation. That we can give him our faults and he can give us forgiveness. Think about shame this morning. Shame. It's so easy, you know, like, 
oh yeah, like Jesus wants you, you know, wants to get rid of your shame. But, but I think shame is an epidemic. I think there's people here today and, 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 and shame is like this piano that's, that's, that's like tied to your back and you're walking around and you can't get past it. You know why? Because you, you, you can't undo what you did. You, you can't say what you said. And amidst all our shame and all our guilt and all our regret is Jesus. Hanging on a cross between two criminals. And he says, why, why don't you give me that shame? And I'll give you a new day and a fresh start. Just find it amazing that shortly before Jesus died, he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And, and I think when we read that, we can think, well, that was contextual. That was contextual. You know, Jesus was looking at the soldiers who had beat him, the, uh, the crowd that was chanting crucify him, those who had denied him, and he was saying forgive them. And I, I, I think in, in some senses that's true. But the one thing you should know about Jesus as you study his ministry years is that everything he did and said had historical implications. So when he said, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing, he was not only talking about the soldiers and the crowds, he was actually talking about you. See, and it really matters. He was talking about me too, you know? Because I, I, I look around this world and I see that there's so much, right? There's beauty and there's hope and there's love. and there, I mean, look around you today, it's incredible. But there's so much wrong. There's violence and there's strife and there's hatred and there's, um, there's people who don't have enough food in our world, you know? They don't have enough to eat. They, they don't have enough to drink. There, 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 there's people in our world, there, there's people in the city today that um, every night when, when they go to bed, they, 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 they don't have any hope. There, there's, there's marriages that are exploding. There's families that are disintegrating. There, there's sickness and there's death. And sometimes... I look at this world and I say, I don't know what I'm doing. How in the world can I help? And you know where that brings me? It, it, it brings me back to the cross. Years and years ago, the London Times put out a question to all the greatest thinkers of the day. And the question was real simple. The question was, what is wrong with the world? What is wrong with the world? And they got answers back from all over the world. But to me, the shortest answer was the most profound. The, 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 the shortest answer came from this uh, author named G.K. Chesterton. And, and his answer said this, in regards to your question of what is wrong with the world, I am. Yours truly. G.K. Chesterton. Here's what's crazy. When I, when I look around the world and I see that there's a lot right, but there's also a, a lot wrong, I see the same thing when I look inside of me. And so here we are again. <clears throat> here we are again at the cross. And the, the question of the cross is basically, um, do you need a hand? And, 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 and we, we could respond to that with a, with a closed fist that says, no, I'm good. I'm, I'm going to build my own stairway to heaven or, or an outstretched hand that says, yeah. And, and here's what happens is slowly, 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 slowly deep inside of me, less darkness and more light less despair and more hope less hate and more love less bitterness and more forgiveness less weak and more strong less afraid and more courageous you get what I'm saying? like slowly, slowly, slowly he begins to change me 
he, he, slowly, he lifts me up out of the muck and the mire and he puts my feet on solid ground. You want to change the world? You want to change the world? Because I do. And you know where it starts? Every day, it starts at the cross. So just as I prepare to close, you know, so I said prepare to close. I didn't actually say that I'm closing right away. But as I prepare to close, I want to just have a moment of reflection. So if you don't mind bowing your heads and closing your eyes, that'd be great. See, because here's what I believe. I believe that there's people, uh, you, you walked in today and, and it was God's plan today to bring you to the cross. And, and, and really, I want to ask you, is today the day that you just give him an outstretched hand and say, Jesus, please, please, lift me out of the muck and the mire. I can't do it on my own because I'm not all right. I need your help. I need your strength, your forgiveness, and your hope. So if that's you today, with all heads bowed and all eyes closed, do you want to just raise your hand? Because I want to pray for you right now. If you don't mind raising it kind of high, that would be awesome. That's great. That's great. <clears throat> so if you just raised your hand, or if you were thinking about raising your hand but you didn't quite get to raising your hand, God sees I'm going to pray out loud, and I ask that you would pray silently with me. Dear Jesus, thank you. Thank you for the cross. <clears throat> Today, I give you everything. I give you my sin and my shame and my regret. I ask that you would give me in exchange forgiveness. Fresh start, new day. Today, Jesus, I ask you to be my Lord. I'm going to follow you, not, not so that you love me. I know that you already love me infinitely, but just I want, I want to follow you into the life that I was born to live, the person that I was born to be. All the way into eternal life. So today, Jesus, I give you my life. In your name. Amen. Let's celebrate that church. Um, I really believe that you want to change the world start at the cross start at the cross and, and then what happens is he, he changes us little by little by little he changes us and he, used change, he uses change us to change the world so next weekend we got uh, it's Easter we got five services I got no idea what time they are but I'll, for, I'll figure it out before next weekend and I'll be there uh, <clears throat> I was just thinking you know God loves every single person in this city. You know that. And part of his plan for some of the people in this city is to place you in their path. So I was just thinking, like, let's pack this place out next weekend. Let's pack it out. So just invite people. Invite the people that God has placed in your path for such a time, for, for this moment. So you can do it on social media or uh, there's hard copies. That's what I'll probably do because I like to just hand it to somebody. Um, but what, whatever you want to do to invite, um, let's do it. I love you guys a lot. See you next week. Thanks for joining us. We'd love to see you at any of our three Sunday services held at Sardis Secondary School on Stevenson Road in Chilliwack, British Columbia. For more information, please visit southsidelife.com.